Tonight, during this Monday, Thursday service, we welcome the seventh grade confirmands to join us at the Lord's Supper as we celebrate their first communion. Tomorrow, Good Friday, services will be at 12.30 and 6.30, and then Resurrection Sunday. Easter services are at 6.30 a.m. sunrise service, services at 8.30 and 10.30. The children will be singing at the 10.30 service, which will be followed by an Easter egg hunt following the 10.30 Resurrection Sunday worship service. On Resurrection Sunday upstairs in the Family Life Center, we will have our annual Easter bake sale where those proceeds go to fund mission opportunities for our congregation and to fund mission partners. We are thankful that you're joining us on this Monday, Thursday, as we now prepare our hearts to worship our Savior Jesus. Church, this evening, we remember the Last Supper of our Lord and His last moments before His betrayal and His death and His resurrection. So let's stand up together as we begin in His name. We begin our worship in the name of the true God, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship. My sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began. As was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over. Me, you have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus rose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began That sweet death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your
we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, we're free, free forever, we're free. And come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. Was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. On this holy Thursday that we call Monday Thursday, we celebrate with our seventh grade confirmands who will be coming to the Lord's Supper with us tonight for the first time as we welcome them to the family of faith. Turn, introduce yourselves to those around you, and may God bless this holy Thursday. Church, you may be seated. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. There's a lot of things to talk about on Maundy Thursday because so much of what the world perceives as Jesus' ministry is coming to an end. 
And on this Maundy Thursday, Jesus and his disciples, just days earlier, had ridden into Jerusalem on what we celebrate as Palm Sunday, where Jesus is welcomed as this almighty, powerful king. And the crowds think that this is going to be the guy, this is going to be the moment when we can finally shake off the oppressive shackles of Rome and the Jews and the Israelites will be free again and Jesus would lead them as a military leader. And then the week transpired and they're going about and they're doing earthly ministry and Jesus continues to teach and preach. And this Thursday, Jesus and his disciples find themselves in the upper room. The upper room that God had already prepared for them for centuries, if not since the beginning of time. And in this upper room, Jesus and his disciples, the people this side of heaven that he was closest to, the guys that he had spent three years investing in, loving and teaching and equipping to be a part of kingdom work, it all culminates into this family meal. And in this family meal, Jesus would do something that probably rattled their ears and they probably didn't understand what was really going on. Because in this meal that you and I know as Holy Communion or the Last Supper or the Sacrament of the Altar, however you read it or talk about it in your minds, Jesus does something and he says, this is a new covenant that I give you. And when Jesus says those words, we don't really hear that word covenant a whole lot in our day-to-day vernacular. Or, I can't speak for you, I don't hear it a whole lot in my day-to-day or use that word ever. So we need to understand when Jesus says covenant, what is he talking about? How should we, as his followers here and now, understand a covenant? Well, first and foremost, a covenant is a binding promise that defines the relationship between two parties. So in the Old Testament, when God made a covenant with his people, frequently you would hear God institute not so much the rules, but you would hear him uh, clarify the borders and the parameters of the relationship. So when God institutes a covenant with Israel, the smallest, weakest nation in the world, The almighty creator of the universe, the one true God, institutes a covenant with them. And he says, I will be your God and you will follow me and you will worship me and you will tell about me for generations. God clearly defines the roles and the expectations between himself as the almighty God, the one true God, and this nation of Israel, the weakest, the smallest, But through the power of God, he would turn them and bless them for generations to come. And the second point that we can understand about a covenant is that one side has nothing to gain and the other side gains everything. So it's not like a contract. See, you and I have contracts in our day-to-day lives. We have contracts with our internet providers. You pay them and you get internet or Wi-Fi most of the time. You have a contract with your cell phone bill. You have a contract with your apartment or your mortgage company. In return, you get something out of it. That's not how it is in a covenant. In a covenant, the balance of power is not equal. The balance of power, one side has nothing to offer and the other side has everything to offer. So as we look at God's covenant history throughout the Old Testament, The Almighty God, who has everything, would bless the nation of Israel and his chosen people with protection, with security, and ultimately with the land that he had promised and set aside for them for years and for ages. And lastly, in a covenant, it's kind of scary because legally speaking, if one party breaks the covenant, if you back out of it or if you break the rules, the offense is punishable up to death. So when Israel, right, frequently throughout their history, if you read the Old Testament, it kind of goes in cycles where God is blessing the nation of Israel and they're doing really well, they're prosperous, everything's going well. Well, then they start to start to wander away. They start to worship other gods or they start to mix in false religions or they just start to walk away from the one true God entirely 
and God allows or causes harm for them, so that way the goal would be that they come back to him in relationship, and God is able to deliver them again. But when we break a covenant, or biblically speaking, when you break a covenant, death is not out of the equation. The prophet Jeremiah, in his writings, he talks about the unfaithfulness of the nation of Israel and how they are so willing to break their covenants because they don't really feel the weight of it. So when Jesus talks about a covenant with these disciples in Passover week, they pay attention because they're probably worried, ooh, I don't want to, I don't want to mess this up. We got to listen to everything because if he's instituting something new, we, and we get it wrong, we could die. But take a look at what Jeremiah has to say about Israel's unfaithfulness and how they willingly break covenants and then God allows them to be delivered into the nation of Babylon. Jeremiah 34, Jeremiah says it like this. And the men who transgressed or who broke my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and pass between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, The eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf. And I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives. Their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. When we think about, or when the disciples think about a covenant, they're familiar with what could happen if they go astray. So when Jesus says, a new covenant I give you, or a new covenant I'm about to establish with you right here and now, there's probably a degree of uncertainty. There's probably some fear. There's some doubts because they don't know what's about to happen. But what we know in hindsight is that Jesus is going to institute a new covenant that would forever change the way that Jesus interacts with his children and the way that the Christian church would continue to spread the name of Jesus and this covenant that would set itself apart from every other false religion in the world. And you see Jesus institute this new covenant in the book of Luke in chapter 22 when he gives these faithful words, what you and I would call the words of institution. And he, Jesus, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they'd eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You see, when we look at the parameters of a covenant, this is a binding relationship where Jesus defines what's going on. This is not just bread. This is not just wine. Jesus says, This is my true body. This is my true blood that I give to you. And in this meal, I'm establishing and instituting a covenant that will last until he returns again in power and glory at the end of time. It completely flips the way that the disciples and the way that the world frequently thinks about covenants. Because in the old covenants, God's people risked death if they broke the covenant. As long as we do what God tells us, and as, we, as long as we stay within these guardrails, we're okay. And God is going to bless us and take care of us. The pressure and the weight was on the people. The people who benefited from the covenant with God. Now, in Holy Communion, in this new covenant that Jesus gives with his children and gives to his disciples, Jesus is preparing for his death. He's preparing to fulfill the plan that God has laid out for him, not for, not for his own glory, but for our benefit, to save his people, to redeem and restore that relationship that had been fractured and broken by sin for so long. Jesus institutes a new covenant to save us. And so when we see a covenant, we see, and when we look at this table, We see Jesus' faithfulness as he gives us his true body and blood in, with, and under this bread and wine. That covenant still goes on to this day. And Jesus' word and his promise is faithful. He never backs out. He never quits on a promise. He never changes it. He says, this is my gift to you. That in my body and in my blood, your sins are forgiven. 
that you have been cleansed, that you've been washed and made greater than snow, whiter than snow, and you don't have to worry about the punishment and the weight of sin or death anymore. And that highlights Jesus' commitment to us. And a covenant is only as fruitful as the commitment of the person in power. When you see in the Old Testament God's covenants and his faithfulness, God's faithfulness never wanes. It never dips. It never falters. Where it wanes and where it, uh, where it kind of fizzles out at points, it's on Israel. It's on God's chosen people because they're sinful. They can't do it perfectly 100% of the time. And in this covenant, we're reminded of that sin that we have. We're reminded of that sin that Jesus went to a cross and bled and died for. But in that covenant, Jesus calls us to just confess our sins. Just tell me where you've messed up. Tell me where you've fallen short. The things you know about and the things you don't know about. That's what this covenant is for you. This covenant is a refresher and it's an assurance that God does not hold the weight of our sin against us anymore. That he poured that wrath on Jesus. The one person who never deserved it, but the person who walks in our place instead so that we would never know true death. We would never know what true separation from God would feel like. Jesus walks that path on our behalf because of his love and because of his commitment to us. So if the strength of a covenant is dependent on the commitment of the greater party, we can rest assured that this covenant is powerful and will keep going for the rest of time because Jesus is the one who institutes and is committed to this covenant. And you see Jesus' commitment even further on. So after they have this meal, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane because in just a few moments, Jesus is going to be arrested by the Romans and that would kickstart his trial, that would lead to his death and lead to his resurrection. But you see Jesus' commitment to us and to the plan of his Father in the next couple of verses. This is Luke 22, verses 41 and 42. And Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see Jesus' humanity in this text. Because he knows what's in store for him. He knows that there's a cross waiting for him. He knows that there's beatings. He knows that there's humiliation. He knows that there's punishment. He knows that there is death right ahead of him. And so you see his humanity saying, God, my heavenly Father, if there is any other way to make this happen, please, let's make this happen. But then he ends it with, but in spite of all that, regardless, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So you see Jesus' commitment to the plan of his Father, regardless of whatever Jesus wants. And we also know what Jesus wants throughout his ministry is to accomplish the will of the one who sent him. And the will of God the Father who sent Jesus into this world is to go to that cross and suffer and die. And you see Jesus' commitment to the Father, but you also see his commitment to us. So if you fast forward in your Bibles and you go to the book of Romans, you see Jesus' heart and his commitment to you. Because maybe you've heard it before, but when Jesus is on the cross, he's thinking of you. He's picturing you. He's picturing our sin. He's picturing the things that should have put us on that cross. But because of his love and because of his commitment to save and restore us, he went to that cross, as Scripture says, joyfully. So we read about Jesus' commitment to us, to save us, in Romans chapter 5. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, now that that relationship is healed, shall we be saved by his life, by his resurrection. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the purpose that Jesus went to the cross for. He wanted to mend and fix this relationship that had been broken for so long. Maybe you know what that feels like. You know, I don't know your stories in depth or in totality like you do or like God does. But if you ever have the blessing or maybe you have the experience of a relationship that 
let's just say maybe it was broken. Maybe there was a person in your life that you cut out for one reason or another, and then sometime later you found that reconciliation. You know the weight that gets lifted off your shoulders. You know that, that energy, that newness of life when you think about that person. And if you don't know that, if you don't know that joy, I want you to think about it this way. God, today, and everywhere, and every time that we have Holy Communion, he invites you to take part in that reconciliation because of his power, and because of his authority. And right, reconciliation, right, sometimes it's a mediated conversation. Sometimes it's between you and the person. Maybe there's somebody who's kind of facilitating and helping things along. Sometimes reconciliation just kind of happens naturally on its own. Like the relationship starts to heal gradually over time, and you can't remember what you ever fought about. But biblically, this is what reconciliation looks like. It looks like the God of the universe, our Savior Jesus Christ, having a meal, having a dinner with the people he loves most in this world. It looks like God, the, the, the authority, the almighty power in this covenant, opening up not just his arms, but giving us his true body, giving us his true blood, so that way we can have a relationship with him in such a close and personal way that when he invites us to this table, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to wonder if God still truly loves us. Or that if he really does mean it when he forgives us all of our sins, we know that because of who Jesus is and his character, that he truly does. So if you feel like you're far from God, if you feel like this reconciliation needs to to happen in some way, shape, or form, listen to the words of your Savior Jesus, the one who created you and the one who redeemed you. He says, come take and eat. Come, take and drink, and rest assured that because of who holds all the power in this covenant, that your sins are forgiven and that this relationship is restored now and forever. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we walk through this holy week, we find ourselves here, drawn to your table. The same table that Jesus set before the, set before the disciples. And Lord, tonight, we're bringing all of who we are. We're bringing our stories. We're bringing our mistakes. We're bringing our sin. But Lord, we confess that sin to you. We know that we're not worthy of any of the blessings that you've given us. But God, your love for us drowns all that out. Your desire to redeem and restore us and to fix that relationship that was broken for so long calls us to this table where Jesus says to receive forgiveness, to start that reconciliation and to rest assured that you love us, to rest assured that that you don't hold the weight of our sin against us anymore. So Lord, as we come to your table tonight, we come confessing our sins. We come ready to receive Jesus' true body and blood and knowing and resting assured that because of what he accomplished for us on the cross, that all of our sins are forgiven. Lord, it's this prayer and the prayers we have in our hearts that we cast at your feet and we lay them before the table because you hear us, you love us, and you sustain us. We pray all this in your most holy and powerful name. And all God's people said, amen. Church, we respond to the word of God by giving him a portion of what he has already blessed us with in our tithes, offerings, our gifts, and our sacrifices. So as you are preparing your offerings, or if you're joining us virtually and you want to give electronically, you can do so now, however the Spirit should move in you to do. The Bible tells us that before we come to the table of the Lord, that we are to examine ourselves. And so we begin to prepare our hearts, bodies, souls, and minds for the sacrament of Holy Communion. We ask the seventh grade confirmants to please rise. 
as you are welcomed to the table for the Lord's Supper, we make a profession of our Christian faith with a responsive reading. I'll read the pastor part, you'll read the confirmation part, and they, everybody else will read the all part. Why are we to receive the Lord's Supper, confirmands? Christ commands us with his words of this do in remembrance of me. His words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins promise and offer us great blessings. We need the forgiveness of our sins and the strength for a new and holy life. We pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Confirmand, you may be seated. As we come to the Lord's table, we come confessing our sins as we're coming down the aisles. As we're confessing our sins, we receive the body and blood of Jesus for forgiveness, knowing that we have that peace and assurance that our sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And then when you return back to your seats, you thank God for his forgiveness and for his grace that he gives to us in, with, and under this bread and wine through his body and blood. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is New Testament of my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this often as you drink it in remembrance of me to you all. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Crimson stain, he washed it white as 
I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. 
just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve us in the one true faith until life everlasting as we depart in his peace and in his joy. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you the only he can give you, his eternal peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated as we prepare our hearts for the stripping of the altar. After the Last Supper, less than 24 hours remained in the earthly life of our Lord Jesus. Events moved rapidly, prayer in Gethsemane, betrayal by Judas, Jesus' arrest, mock trial, painful beating, the trek to Golgotha, and finally, execution. Altar flowers are a sign of spring and new life. In the passion and suffering of Jesus, human life and freedom from sin springs forth from him. The flowers, once vibrant and colorful, are now removed, symbolizing the temporary nature of earthly beauty and the fleetingness of life. We reflect on the brevity of life and the need for our Savior above all else. Jesus' body and blood have been given to us in, with, and under the bread and wine in this holy mystery of communion. As Jesus was removed from us in the grave, so we remove the elements and vessels of his presence in the Lord's Supper. We respond together. We reflect on the meaning of his sacrifice, knowing that through his death, we have been redeemed and reconciled to God. The missile stand holds our readings and prayers and songs that guide our worship life together. As Jesus suffers, sounds of joy and praise are removed from our lips, so we remove the missile stand from the altar. We commit ourselves anew to worship God in spirit and in truth in our daily lives. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, verse 12. The events of Golgotha snuffed out the human life of Jesus, the light of the world. As darkness covered creation when Jesus suffered, so we extinguish our candles and we remove them. We respond together. We contemplate the depth of his love and the extent of his sacrifice for us.
when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, verse 29. As this statement was fulfilled on the cross, the Christ candle is removed, and we respond together. We reflect on the light that Christ has brought into our lives and the hope that he has given us through his death and resurrection. The altar is a place where our Lord Jesus serves us as both host and meal at his banquet feast. The coverings and pyramids are made of fine linen and brocade, materials appropriate for feasting with our king. As our king's body was stripped in crucifixion, so our altar is stripped of its coverings, and we respond together. We strip away our pride and self-righteousness, laying ourselves bare before God, acknowledging our need for his mercy and grace. To dark Gethsemane, all who feel the tempter's power, your Redeemer's conflict see, watch with him one bitter hour. Turn not from his griefs away, learn from Jesus Christ to pray. Follow to the judgment hall, view the Lord of life arraigned. Oh, the warm wood and the gall, oh, the pangs his soul sustained, shall not suffering shame or loss, Learn from him to bear the cross. Calvary's mournful mountain climb, there adoring at his feet. Mark that miracle of time, God's own sacrifice complete, it is finished. 